Hello, good afternoon, dear colleagues and dear participants. As Associate Dean of FGV Direito São Paulo, I would like to say that it's a great pleasure to have you all here to start the second section of the first week of the second University of Chicago Fundação Getúlio Vargas Forum in Law and Economics in Brazil. This online second forum, Chicago FGV, fulfills, at least in part, the intention of taking forward the joint initiative of our law schools to organize annual meetings uh, on law and economics in Brazil. We believe this online forum is a good sample of what, what we expect to do face to face next year in Rio and Sao Paulo. I would like to take this opportunity to thank my colleagues, Omri ben from the University of Chicago Law School and Rodrigo Viana from FGV Direitos Rio. I'm grateful for all their energy and enthusiasm to organize this venture. Our special thanks to the Chicago and FGV teams that spare no effort to make this event happen in the best possible way. Before we start, I would like to remind you that all statements expressed by Fundação Getúlio Vargas employees and guests in our online events and broadcasts exclusively represent their opinions and not necessarily FGV's institutional position. We also reiterate that everyone presents here agreed to participate in this event of their own free will, and they consented to be recorded in this broadcast, which will be posted later at FTVs and Chicago University official channels. This week, we are debating the economic analysis of climate change regulation. Last Thursday, we had the opportunity to attend a lecture by Professor David Wasbach from the Chicago University. This afternoon, we will have a lecture by our colleague, Romulo Silveira da Rocha Sampaio, our dear colleague from the FGV Direito Rio. Also, <clears throat> you a pleasure to uh, uh, have all this fantastic audience. Please, I'd like to ask for my colleague, Rodrigo, to introduce uh, uh, Professor Romulo Sampaio. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Maria Lucia. Hello, everyone. Happy to see you all here again. Well, uh, I'm Rodrigo Viana, the head of the International Affairs Office at FGV Direito Rio. Uh, and in this second lecture, I have the pleasure to introduce my friend and FGV Direito Rio professor Romulo Sampaio. Uh, Romulo Sampaio. Romulo holds a PhD and an LLM degree in environmental law from Pace University also has a master in an LLB from the Catholic University of Paraná in Brazil. Romulo teaches at FGV Direito Rio's undergraduate program and at the graduate program in regulatory law. He is also adjunct professor at Pace University in New York and visiting professor at Georgia State University College of Law in Atlanta. Moreover, Romulo leads several research within the scope of environmental law and environmental regulation, since he has experience in these fields, working mainly in the areas of sustainability, environmental governance, climate change, and water regulation. The audience is free to send questions through the YouTube chat, and I will be happy to select some of them to be answered in the end of the presentation if we have time. Uh, Romulo, many thanks again for your presence to join the program, and the floor is yours. We hope uh, we had a great afternoon again, and everyone is it's, uh, already invited to follow the next weeks where we we'll have when we will have another discussions, other discussions related to the law and economics perspective. Many thanks again, Romulo. Good one, Rodrigo. Thank you very much. Uh, it is a great pleasure uh, and honor to be invited uh, to such an important event, uh, in which sense I, I would also like to uh, extend my, 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 my thanks to Professor Maria Lucia uh, for uh, uh, leading with you, Rodrigo, this uh, very important uh, meeting uh, with uh, University of Chicago. I'd also like to, to thank the folks from University of Chicago and congratulate you for the organization and putting together 
uh, very important topic uh, uh, for law and economics scholars such as uh, climate change. So I really appreciate, I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, and I hope I can shed some lights uh, further to Professor Weisbach's uh, presentation uh, last Tuesday. Uh, he left very, very little things for me to explore uh, as his uh, magna class uh, was uh, very comprehensive. He gave us and he provided us a very great overlook of the very, very recent IPCC report, which is, which is uh, very, very scary if we look uh, uh, to, to their major findings. Uh, we, he also shed uh, some very important lights uh, over the main issues uh, that law and economic scholars have uh, nowadays uh, in terms of, uh, of climate change, uh, climate change uh, law. So uh, after, uh, after attending his presentation, I was planned I was planning to, so what is left for me to talk? So I decided to, to give a step back and a step forward to Mr. David's Weisbach conversation because he, he mentioned how hard it is uh, to find a solution, a policy solution, assuming we have a problem. So, so this is a very important disclosure. Uh, uh, you know, my lecture here will assume that we do have a problem. Uh, and if we do have a problem, what is the role of law? And within the role of law, what is the role of scholars in the, in the field of uh, law and economics? Uh, so the step back I wanna, I wanna take from Professor David Weisbach's uh, uh, presentation is precisely uh, trying to understand a little bit more uh, of what is the problem, why it is so difficult to find an agreement uh, on, a, on an effective or, or a set of effective policies to fight uh, the problem ahead of us. Uh, and then the step forward, I wanna, I wanna, I wanna take from Professor uh, Weisbach's uh, lecture is uh, to, to get into more details on climate change litigation, on how climate change litigation is pushing forward uh, some of, uh, of, of the more urgent needs uh, uh, we have in light of our policy design. Uh, and for that, I think there is a great room for law and economic scholars as I, will, as I shall explore uh, further in my, in my, in my presentation. Uh, and finally, I wanna just talk a little bit about Brazil. Uh, see, Brazil is, a, is, a, is an environmental giant. And as an environmental giant, uh, Brazil is also a key player in any kind of climate change negotiation. So, so it is very important that, uh, you know, since this is uh, an international uh, uh, um, uh, seminar, uh, that we offer a little bit of insight on what's going on currently in Brazil relating to, to climate change. So with that, I will uh, share uh, my PowerPoint point presentation here. Um, let me see here if I if I got this right. I believe I did. Okay. Very well. So the first thing to understand, assuming we have a problem, like I said, so that's the disclosure I, I'd like to, to make from the very, very beginning of my of my presentation is that the world is shrinking and is shrinking really, really fast, much faster than uh, law and institutions uh, have the ability to deal with. Uh, if we think uh, to the left, uh, it's an interesting compilation of, of how fast the world uh, uh, technology accelerated, in the, especially in the past, uh, in the past century. Uh, uh, in, that, that acceleration led us to, to greater uh, 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 concentrations of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So there is a direct connection there, uh, as, as Professor Weisbach pointed out uh, on Tuesday. Uh, so I will not go over the details of that. I just want to point out that, uh, yes, the Industrial Revolution is, is, is blamed as the one uh, that changed the course of greenhouse gas concentration. Uh, 
but I'm I'm very convinced that uh, the second, if you will, industrial revolution was uh, the most uh, uh, impacting one. Uh, and by second uh, industrial revolution, I mean the period post uh, two great wars uh, in the 20th uh, century. Um, there are great literature about uh, how uh, technology industries and 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 also consumption patterns uh, uh, were changed due to the technological advancement uh, we witnessed uh, uh, coming out of the two great world wars. And, and if we look to this uh, CO2 concentration in the atmosphere, uh, we can see that af right after 1930 uh, and 40s, that's when we see a huge uh, escalation of, uh, of a steep escalation of greenhouse gas concentrations in, in the atmosphere. And this is an interesting topic because we are used to dealing with environmental destruction since, uh, since humans are, uh, are on the planet. That's not new. Uh, uh, humans have dealt with uh, environmental destructions for, for a long, long time. But they dealt with environmental destruction in a public good type of uh, economic uh, uh, approach. Uh, so the way historically humans, we all dealt with environmental destruction was uh, through migration. There's a great book from a United States uh, scholar, historian, talking about the history of the occupation of the Atlantic rainforest in Brazil. The Atlantic rainforest in Brazil is this huge biodiverse uh, uh, area. Uh, something like twice the size of France that uh, spans over the coast of Brazil. And for a lot of, uh, of, uh, of, of researchers, it, it holds a greater degree of biodiversity than the Amazon, uh, which is the famous one. And, and in his book, this, uh, this American historian dedicated to understanding the uh, colonization of, of, of the Atlantic rainforest, reports that the indigenous people who lived here uh, uh, in, this, in this part of the, the world have dealt traditionally with the destruction of the forest to plant for subsistence. And then after the land was no longer suitable for agriculture, sustainable agriculture, they would migrate to a different place. So we, if, if in Brazil or every other, other place, uh, the way we dealt with environmental destruction was through migration. Um, and that was not necessarily bad. The indigenous had this uh, slash and burn practice, uh, but since uh, there were very few uh, and their agriculture was uh, for uh, subsistence, uh, by the time they left behind a degraded uh, land, uh, it would take time uh, uh, for, for the for, for that particular environment to, to build up back. Uh, so, so that was not uh, necessarily a problem. But like we said, since uh, we are now a crowded uh, planet, hot and crowded, uh, to quote the title of a famous book um, in the United States, uh, the planet is smaller and the environmental problems are now not local or regional anymore, they are global in nature. They are at the planetary level. So we face a big challenge, which is how do we migrate from this environmental problem, from the environmental problems uh, we are creating? Uh, because of course, that's not possible, at least in the near future, or at least for those who are not uh, billionaires with money to spend on space machines, um, we need to, as, 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 as a group of species, uh, we need to find uh, a solution. But there are enormous difficulties uh, to find solutions as uh, for whenever we have a lot of people uh, to solve a planetary problem in which we don't have the power of coercion. Uh, that uh, that uh, humans built with uh, the notion of uh, sovereign states. So when we go through the international arena, that's the huge challenge we have 
And we've been trying to do that with climate change since 1992 or even before that, but with more emphasis after the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change in 1992. And, and we, we have to realize we haven't done a big job or, or, or a nice job since then. Uh, we have to come to realize we failed so far. Uh, the Paris Agreement gave, gave us some momentum, some excitement that we could move on. And now we're struggling in, in, in expectations uh, of what's going to be the outcomes of the Glasgow meeting um, uh, late this year. But why do we have such a problem? Uh, there are a lot of people who wrote about this, a lot of famous uh, 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 scholars who wrote about the problem of finding a solution when we have a collective action problem, uh, uh, which is the inability of groups to develop and implement agreements. That's a very basic, uh, very basic, basic literature uh, to use in any introduct introduction to environmental regulation. Um, but there are two major obstacles uh, that I would like to highlight. The problem of coordination and what Nash would call the prisoner's dilemma. Uh, somebody is always trying to be uh, uh, better off than another person. And then that means uh, we have uh, difficulties to find uh, a solution that serves better uh, everyone. So if we multiply that for 7 billion people, which we have in the planet with different views, with different beliefs, um, denying science and a whole bunch of other problems, um, that becomes um, a, a, very, a very important problem ahead of us to solve uh, climate change. Uh, and why it is important for us to solve climate change? But, People haven't actually realized why, why is it important, but I think David Weisbach uh, uh, pointed it out that uh, we can, we can it, he showed a graphic that was very, 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 uh, uh, very good because if we can go as warm as one degree Celsius or we can go warm, well, we can go as high as six degrees Celsius uh, of, uh, of, of, warming the, the global temperature. And in, in, in six degrees Celsius, a lot of people saying this calamity. Uh, we don't know what we don't know. Uh, it could be the on David's words, and it's not, I'm sure, his words, but uh, he's relying on the, the work of scientists. It could be the end of uh, humanity as, as, as we know. So, so it is important for us as lawyers or academics uh, to, to see how can we work the law uh, around to solve a problem that may kill us all. Uh, and the law was never shaped. We're not, we're not used to working with law to solve uh, uh, future problems filled with uncertainties, and I'll talk a little bit about that uh, in a moment, that could uh, uh, imply uh, the end of uh, humanity as we know. So, so I don't, I don't think uh, lawmakers, uh, scholars have ever been put to a challenge uh, as big as this one uh, that it's ahead of us. Uh, so, normally the solution that we found in law was uh, designing institutions conducive to people obeying commands, what we know as the rule of law. Uh, and creating the right incentives for people to work in together. But it's easier said than done, of course. And that's why we'll find very important people like Clay Shirky saying that, you know, uh, who are very skeptical of, 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 you know, our ability to solve this kind of problem. And as uh, his quote is here in the, in the PowerPoint is that there is no larger collective action problem than the environment. And... According to him, the three biggest lies of the environmental movement is that every little bit helps. You can do your part and together we can do it. Of course, uh, there is an exaggeration, but what he's telling us is that um, uh, it won't matter if myself as an individual 
uh, bring my eco bag to the supermarket or if I uh, don't drive to work, uh, if I act much more uh, as a citizen than a consumer. Uh, which is also an interesting uh, thing that David pointed out uh, in his presentation. Um, uh, we blame uh, those who big companies who contribute to climate change, but we drive to work. And, and that's, uh, there's a lot of work on that, saying how we individuals uh, act differently when we act as consumers and when we act as citizens. Uh, but I won't go into much details, but, uh, but I think the underlying message of Clay Shirk is exactly that. You know, humans acting as citizens uh, will not solve the problem because uh, the problem is much bigger uh, than, than uh, we, we might have. So to begin understanding the complexity of the problem, as I said, there is a whole bunch of people who, doing great work or who did great work um, and, and they've, they've been doing this for a while. And uh, Manco also, I think, is one of the predecessors of, uh, uh, of, of the collective, act, collect, collective action problem and, and his quote, unless the number of individuals is quite small or unless there is coercion or some other special device to make individuals act in their common interest, rational self-interested individuals will not act to achieve their common uh, or group interests. So he's raising that problem in 1965. We need some sort of coercion. We need some sort of incentives to, to get people to work together. And that is hard uh, within a country, within a country which obeys the rule of law. Uh, and we know that uh, because uh, we live in big democracies uh, and it is hard to, 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 to have those interests align uh, around a problem. And then when we talk about climate change, we escalate that to, to a whole different level, to a whole different uh, uh, problem. Uh, and then since uh, also we have, uh, you know, the, the seminal work of uh, Eleanor Ostrom, uh, we have, you know, the anecdote of Garrett Harding uh, speaking of the tragedy of the commons and John Nash uh, prisoner's dilemma. Uh, they're all uh, in some way talk about how difficult it is uh, to find a solution uh, when, when we face uh, the problem of, uh, of coordination. Uh, um, and to add to that uh, uh, problem, I, I borrowed from David's presentation to this, those two graphics uh, showing who has contributed most to global CO2 emissions uh, and uh, who emits the most CO2. And those two questions that uh, David brought on Tuesday are very important because they inspired a very strong principle of uh, climate change law which is the principle of common but differentiated responsibility, which is just another face of the problem. I also, I always like to say that uh, for people who, who, who ask me, why did you think Kyoto uh, uh, did, not, uh, did not save us? Why do you think the UNFCCC was not successful until now? Why do you think Kyoto, uh, um, uh, standards, uh, the ones that imposed uh, 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 limitations on greenhouse gas emissions over developed countries, did not go forward. Well, I think the, 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 to start this uh, understanding why we weren't successful uh, with Kyoto uh, was because the United States and China were out of, of, of Kyoto. The United States, because as David pointed out on Tuesday, did not uh, uh, ratify the Kyoto Protocol. It signed, but it not ratified. The US Congress uh, opposed the Kyoto Treaty. Uh, and therefore, the United States was not uh, uh, bound uh, by the Kyoto uh, limitations, quantitative limitations, uh, emissions set forth in the Kyoto Protocol. And China was out because of this principle, common but differentiated responsibility, who left developing countries out of any 
emissions targets uh, in the Kyoto Protocol. And if we, if we added both of them, uh, they were pretty much until very recently, uh, almost 50% of the problem. So it was out. So we had two countries out of the, the effort. Uh, so we had two very big free riders uh, and we had the other half of the problem trying to reach an agreement uh, to save uh, at least the other half. The problem is that there is no other half. We either save it all or we, we sink it all. Uh, if we look to the graph currently, who emits the most, uh, like brought by David, uh, common but differentiated responsibilities, just another face of the problem, when we look at this other face of the problem and we look to current emissions, we see that China now is the biggest emitter, but the United States still a very significant one. And if you take uh, China uh, and the United States, uh, they are uh, roughly uh, 40, 43 percent of the 42, 43 percent of the of the problem. So yet a big chunk of, of the effort we need uh, to move forward. So which means uh, at least uh, under uh, collective action uh, uh, strategy that we should start by a bilateral agreement between, the, between China and the United States. Uh, and then we'll have a, a big, big part of the of the of the group uh, committed uh, to doing something that it's actually meaningful in terms of uh, mitigating emissions or net zero emissions or negative emissions, ideally, as the point we want to reach. Uh, so these two these two questions uh, uh, considered against uh, the common but differentiated responsibilities shows us that well-intentioned people or a well-intentioned country will not solve the problem, which highlights the importance of a concerted collective action solution, uh, unprecedented one to solve um, uh, the problem of, uh, of, of climate change. And it is true that, uh, let's say, uh, Leonor Ostrom showed that uh, there are there are ways of, uh, of solving collective action problems. And then she conducted, she's, she's a Nobel, uh, economic Nobel Prize awardee. Uh, and she conducted extensive research showing that uh, in some communities of common goods, um, it was possible to reach uh, an understanding to avoid the Garrett Harding's uh, anecdote tragedy of the commons. Uh, but her experiments were, 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 were very small communities. We never faced the, the problem of having to uh, deal with this collective action uh, 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 problem at a worldwide level uh, in a such serious matter that could uh, imply, uh, if some scientists are, are correct, uh, the extinction of uh, humanity uh, from the planet. So the question becomes how to create uh, coercion uh, to solve uh, this huge problem ahead of us. Uh, that's the, what my American friends like to say, the $1 million question, because it's what everybody's trying to answer. So whenever you hear, oh, I, I think, uh, I think, uh, a carbon market is a solution, or I think we should have a, a carbon tax. Um, the people are always, are, at the end of the day, they're trying to see how uh, to create a coercion to solve this unprecedented uh, a problem. Because remember, uh, international law does not give us the teeth that domestic law gives us to solve any given problem. So in the lack of teeth, of international law to give us uh, this coercion that we need, uh, you will see a lot of people talking about different kinds of incentives to move the world ahead uh, uh, to some sort of solution. Uh, the problem is that we are, uh, we are becoming out of time. Uh, so the question is, do we have 
the time to move forward and to move forward fast, well, let's look at multilateral, multilateral environmental agreements because one thing the world has done successfully ever since I'd say the Stockholm Declaration on the Human Environment uh, in 1972 is agreeing on multilateral environmental agreements. So we've, you know, the international community is very effective in agreeing in the multilateral environmental agreements. There are a whole bunch of them out there. Um, but when we look to climate change, uh, there are difficulties in, in multilateral environmental agreements to solve climate change. That's why we see so much uh, hopes uh, every year than we, when we have the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change Conference of the Parties. People get very excited. No, uh, we're going to solve it at everything in Paris. And then Paris comes and then we start talking. About, well, let's take a step behind. We'll solve everything in Kyoto. Kyoto will be the treaty that will save us all under the UNFCCC, and then we have Kyoto, and then Kyoto doesn't work as we thought it should have worked. And then a whole bunch of excitement towards the Paris Agreement. So now it's the Paris Agreement that will save us. Now we're talking about the Glasgow Agreement, and next year we'll be talking about the agreement named after the city that will host uh, the Conference of the Parties. And we've we've we we are almost uh, we're we're doing that for almost 30 years now since the 1992 uh, UNFCCC. And why why is that? Uh, because that's is the empirical uh, evidence of uh, some obstacles uh, we face, uh, which is climate change. When we talk about climate change, damages suffered by one country are due to the level of total emissions pressed and passed of all countries. So the damages of uh, those who are climate refugees in small island developing states in the Pacific region uh, uh, are done to, to emissions caused uh, in the past and in the present by virtually all countries. So it's hard to find a responsible party to come to the table and solve the agreement. And that takes us to two very important uh, economic uh, uh, issues, which is efficiency and equity. Uh, how to balance uh, overall benefits and costs. Uh, and then here we turn to, to the uncertainty of uh, uh, surrounding the problem, uh, because when we can balance benefits and costs, we can deal more easily uh, from an economic perspective of regulation with the with the this two these two very important issues efficiency and equity uh, when we can't really generate data uh, to measure benefits and costs uh, talking about efficiency and equity becomes uh, quite a challenge um, when we bring back together the common but differentiated responsibilities uh, that basically will, it is a principle, it's, it's, it's a point the finger principle. It is basically developing countries saying to the developed countries uh, that, look, you used most of our stock of greenhouse gas emissions, as David showed us on Tuesday. Uh, if we rely on the available science, our stock to meet the Paris uh, goals of 1.5 uh, degrees Celsius is at the very end. Uh, we've used pretty much 100% of the, all the stock of greenhouse gases, emissions that we could possibly emit to meet the Paris Agreement. So that means uh, if and then we bring back the, the, the pointing finger principle or the common but differentiated responsibilities means that there is a deadlock in this multilateral environmental agreement, which is the developing country saying, because we're, we ran out of our stock and you have used most of this stock, you should the one uh, bearing uh, more heavily abatement costs but from an economic perspective, that, not, that may be not the smartest way to go because there might be ways of uh, offsetting greenhouse gas at a lower price in different countries who did not contribute very much to the stock uh, 
uh, to, to the usage of the stock uh, uh, of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, but then we have to play the fairness card here. Uh, it is fair, it is not fair. Uh, so that's a huge obstacle to overcome uh, because uh, I would use an economic uh, argument to say, look, it is better and more and cheaper from an economic perspective to, to solve the problem in your country than it is in my country. Then uh, this country who, is, who has the cheaper solution will say, but this is not fair because you are responsible. You use more of the stocks uh, available. So you see how this gets really tricky in a negotiation table among diplomats who are themselves answering to a whole bunch of different uh, interests uh, within uh, groups of interests in their, in their respective countries. Uh, but when we talk about regulation, environmental regulation, abatement costs, it's, it's paramount to creating a better environmental regulation, but that's easier done at the domestic level then of course it is at the level of a multilateral environmental agreement. Um, if we could use economic theory here, maybe incorporating country difference in abatement abilities could increase or certainly would increase economic efficiency. But on the other hand, as I pointed out, uh, would increase significantly the cost of the negotiation process. And that's why uh, we can start explaining we are 30 years down the road since 1992 trying to find a climate change solution. The hopes now lie on the Glasgow uh, meeting uh, in the end of the year. And I'm, I'm positive that there will be another set of hopes for whichever city hosts the conference of the party uh, in the year to come. So enough about problems and let's talk a little bit about solutions. Uh, and I, I can't, uh, I can't uh, uh, not talk about uh, what also David brought it up in his, in his presentation, the idea of a climate clubs uh, uh, authored by William Nordhams, which is also uh, a Nobel, economic Nobel prize uh, awardee. Uh, uh, and he and he proposed that countries uh, sign up voluntarily, forming up a coalition, and they would agree on a carbon price applied within their borders. And there seems to be a movement uh, towards that in Europe, as David uh, highlighted. And as I'm feeling here in some of the discussions I've been participating, as a matter of fact, a very a very close friend of mine earlier today gave me a call and asked me whether I was aware of uh, some sort of a, uh, of a carbon price that European countries were designing and how would that impact uh, antitrust law and, and the World Trade Organization uh, regime. Uh, the things that David had talked to us uh, on Tuesday. Uh, so you see that there is a growing preoccupation and there is a growing, at least from the way I'm, 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 I'm seeing, uh, view that uh, important countries forming clubs might be the way, uh, at least in the near future, or, or to try to solve this collective action problem, uh, or at least might be the way uh, of trying something that we haven't tried in the past. Uh, and eventually we'll see how that works. If it doesn't work, it served as another experiment uh, to see whether, whether we, we can or whether we, we can't move forward. As also David pointed out, border adjustments will not give us significantly uh, cuts in greenhouse gas emissions, but maybe uh, climate clubs uh, will give us a uniform set of a carbon price that will eventually uh, 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 bring the, the, the greenhouse gas concentrations uh, down. Uh, so if we are able to try that, we also have to, to overcome uh, the problem of uh, uncertainty. And I think 
this is also another topic uh, David highlighted, but I want to specific talk a little bit more about uncertainty because let's say we try a climate club uh, solution or we don't try, but there are things happening at domestic levels everywhere. European countries are, are trying to put a price or trying to regulate cl climate change. Uh, there are other countries doing that as well, um, but we have to overcome uh, a, a very important issue, which is uh, uncertainty. And this is a completely new area uh, for lawmakers. Uh, inaugurates what we call the risk regulation area, but it, it, it is also a, a new way to look into how decisions are done at the regulatory level. Uh, which means um, regulators uh, were used to in countries uh, with a long uh, uh, historical tradition in regulating like the United States. Uh, they were very well uh, uh, used to with a cost benefit analysis. So I will create this sophisticated methodology. I will look into what are the the the, the the benefits and I will compare with the costs. And if the benefits are greater than the costs, then we'll move on. If the costs are greater than the benefits, uh, then I will not uh, regulate. Of course, there are a whole bunch of issues relating to that, but that doesn't necessarily work for uncertainty. That works for risks. And I refer to Frank Knight's uh, book, because he's, he's became known for differentiating the notion of risk from the notion of uncertainty uh, to the point that uh, Knight is known as uh, uh, for, for in decision theory for, for this concept of uh, uh, uncertainty, how to take decisions in contexts where you cannot measure uh, the impacts uh, the, the potential impacts of certain actions. Uh, and a risk is a situation where uh, you might not know uh, what will be exactly the outcome, but you can assign probabilities for different outcomes. Uh, so on the one hand, we have to balance scientific data regarding the impacts of climate change. And on the other hand, we have to deal with institutional design to make concerted action possible. The more uncertainty, the more skeptical, the more difficult it is to rationalize around the problem. Of course, the more difficult it is to move forward. Um, and that's why a lot of people have written about uncertainty and cost benefit analysis. Should we approach the climate change problem uh, through uh, with a cost benefit analysis? And I think um, David, uh, showed us how it is uh, trying, they're trying to, to do that in the United States by calculating the, the, the social cost of, of carbon. Uh, but uh, there are scholars who have challenged whether um, issues uh, that are under the uh, scope of uncertainty are subject to a cost benefit analysis, considering you, you're not able to measure. So if you cannot measure, how are you going to assign pros and cons? Um, remember, uh, an uncertainty scenario can be described as uh, things you, you don't know what you don't know. Uh, so so, so it's, it's, it's what David said, it's deep uncertainty. So if it's deep uncertainty, how are you going to measure? If you're not able to measure, how are you going to assign uh, uh, costs and how are you going to calculate the benefits of it? So that's a big problem. It's extremely hard and subjective. It's full of assumptions. And when you have a, 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 an analysis like that full of assumptions, it becomes an analysis that is prone to, to being challenged from, from different groups of interest, from different uh, uh, stakeholders. It is a fragile analysis, uh, if you will. Uh, the potential negative consequence behooves policymakers to act. So, so when we we deal, even if we say, okay, uh, we're not going to use uh, a cost benefit analysis, but here we have a, a, a catastrophe scenario 
that uh, important scientists uh, of very important institutions are telling us could be catastrophic. So if it could be catastrophic, so we're talking about low probability events with fat tails. Uh, low probability events have been dealt by statisticians as thin tails. Uh, so the work of this professor, Dan Farber from uh, Berkeley Law School has been instrumental in trying to come up with a different approach, uh, something in between uh, what he relies on, he calls ambiguity theory, uh, situations in which multiple plausible models of reality confront a decision uh, of a, confronts a policymaker uh, uh, with, a, with a catastrophic decision. So if it is plausible that we might have uh, catastrophe if we reach certain uh, warming temperature around the globe, we got to be uh, uh, attentive and perhaps we have to take a different approach uh, than, than the traditional cost benefit analysis approach in which maybe, uh, as I said, a fragile analysis could could suggest, uh, you know, there's no need to act now. So, so what Dan Farber's proposal is what he's called an alpha precautionary principle, uh, which is briefly and very, you know, in a very, very short summary, uh, when a policymaker uh, cannot quantify risks and face nightening uncertainty, uh, referring to uh, the notion of Frank Knight's uh, deep uncertainty. And, and this is not the, the traditional precautionary principle chaos uh, we see when we open an environmental law book or, or you know, people saying, you know, precaution means don't do anything and apply precaution to every single situation of life uh, in, in, a, in a very uh, untechnical, unscientific way. This is a rather... Uh, uh, this, this Dan Farber's proposal relies on a mathematical tool uh, of various kinds uh, to deal with uncertainty. Um, and, and it relies on the work of uh, statisticians and, and this uh, review of economics and statistics brings uh, 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 the article, this article of uh, Martin Wiseman who is used by, by Dan Farber's in his analysis, which is on modeling and interpreting the economics of catastrophic climate change. Uh, so, so, so it's a way of bringing uh, mathematical tools and statistic, statistic models uh, to, to, to call for some sort of a alternative or something in between cost-benefit analysis and, 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 and precaution, simply precaution, uh, to deal with the problem of uh, climate change. So... Uh, either through cost-benefit analysis, uh, if we're able to precisely put a price on the social cost of carbon and then make the assumptions needed for a strong and robust uh, uh, cost-benefit analysis or through the alpha precautionary principle, I think there is under one or other approach, there is uh, uh, consensus uh, and this consensus uh, from those who write more extensively about this problem seems to be we need to act and we need to act urgently. Uh, meaning we need net zero emissions or negative emissions as, as, as very well pointed out by, by my former colleague, uh, David uh, Weisbach. So near term solution. Uh, we need technologies of production, distribution and consumption that require smaller quantities of energy. Remember, this was also said by David, as I said, this lecture was very comprehensive. Climate change is an energy problem. So if you're going to work with climate change, you are going to work with energy law. So here we're talking about how to solve an energy problem. How do we transition uh, our energy matrix in the world? Uh, of course, there are issues with deforestation, land use, agriculture, and other sources of of greenhouse gas, but there seems to be a consensus that uh, if we should pick a priority, let's stick with the energy because energy is, is where uh, our greatest potential to move uh, lies. So how do we do that? 
And then thinking, preparing for this, uh, for this meeting, I say, how do we do that? And that brings me to the step ahead of uh, David's Tuesday uh, lecture. Um, we're going to talk about how do we successfully do. So we talk about uh, collective action problems uh, that uh, create these huge obstacles. We have explored the new idea on the table uh, from uh, Nordhaus, uh, the climate clubs. We talked so far about uh, how uncertainty plays a big and important role in, in, in policymaking design here. Um, but how do, we, how do we actually can be successful in providing for policies that will bring us near-term solutions. And, and, and now I'm going to take the step forward uh, from David's lecture, as I said, but I will also take, in taking this step forward, I will go back to the basics. How do we do, how do we go about regulation of safety? And then we can see how this circles back. We can talk again about command and control, carbon tax, markets, offset, ethics, uh, if we're able to overcome the free rider problem at the worldwide level, we can talk about all of these uh, this, uh, policy designs. Uh, but the problem is we have been talking about that for a long, long time. Kyoto tried a type of command and control, setting uh, targets, quantitative emissions targets upon developed countries. Did not work, as I said, one of the major emitters did not ratify the protocol. We try carbon tax. Uh, there are a lot of countries with carbon tax, uh, but unless we have a carbon tax at a club level or in a lot of different countries, as David pointed out, that will be very good, but uh, will not solve the problems. We have tried markets, a lot of countries with markets. Kyoto tried a market. We tried offsets. There was offset in Kyoto. We uh, were constantly, uh, opening open the, the newspapers and television show, TV shows, and we're constantly seeing appeals for, you know, we need to act as more as citizens and less as consumers. Uh, but what if it takes more time than we have to actually build some sort of a regulation of safety tool that will bring this near-term solution that we, we want? How do we have that time? Apparently, according to the scientists, we're running out of time and we're running out of time quickly. Um, so what's going on? I think reflecting for this lecture, I think what's going on and after, uh, after uh, seeing, watching uh, David's lecture, I think we're going back to the basics. We're seeing all over again, but at a different scale. And why do I say that? I say that because uh, when we started uh, the first environmental problems, the local environmental problems, if we take the Cuyahoga River in, in Cleveland, uh, the fires in 1960s, uh, or the Love Canal in the United States, or the, the Minamata con Bay contamination in Japan, uh, and a bunch of other, uh, uh, the Exxon Valdez, the bunch of other uh, huge uh, local environmental problems uh, that we faced in the second part of the 20th century. We saw two things. We saw countries, developed countries regulating with command and control. And we saw uh, courts being called upon. Courts were called upon to hold polluters. Uh, at, at that time, they weren't called polluters. They were called tort feasors, uh, liable under tort law for the damage they caused. It was easier for the courts back then because even though for local environmental problems, it is hard to establish causation. It is hard because environmental problems are not a problem like the problems we have in our day-to-day -day life. So it is problems, uh, environmental problems, environmental harms, uh, they're not uh, fairly easy to find responsible people because the harm is not connected in time and space uh, with, uh, with the potential offender, so which makes it hard. But it's even harder at the climate change level. But it was hard back then and the courts were called upon to act. 
And, and that gave rise in 1984 to this uh, seminal article from Stephen Chavel saying, you know, let's compare liability for harm versus regulation of safety. And he came up with four theoretical determinants of social desirability of more regulation or more liability. So I decided to look back to this basic and see whether we're seeing all over again in the context of climate change, 30 plus years after that. And that led me to believe that perhaps it's exactly what it's going on right now. Uh, as David pointed out, and I'll talk a little bit in more details about climate change litigation. So, so those theoretical determinants were basically four that Stephen Chavel used in this, in, this, in this paper. It is first, the difference in knowledge about risky activities between those who regulate and those who are regulated. If we look to climate change, yes, we have a now we have now enough data about uh, the risks of, of of climate change, but this knowledge is not about only the impacts of the harm, uh, but also the benefits of activities, the costs of reducing risks, and the probability or severity of the risks. So, if we look to the second one, costs of reducing risks, uh, although scientists know fairly well now what are the risks and the probabilities uh, that will have uh, extremely harsh events. Uh, the cost of reducing these risks, the knowledge of how much it will cost of reducing these risks uh, in the energy sectors, I believe lies uh, very much with uh, every single organization, energy organization. They know how hard and they know much better than any regulator will be in the places they operate. So whenever you have this difference in knowledge, uh, that means that uh, regulating might not be as efficient as maybe perhaps a liability rule. The second uh, uh, determinant, uh, Chavel's determinant is uh, private parties might be incapable of paying for the full magnitude of harm done. Uh, and, and yes, uh, I, I believe so that private parties uh, in the context of climate change are not fully aware uh, uh, of, of the total cost of harm. Uh, and in this determine, uh, uh, Chavel brings uh, links that determine to insurance law to, to see how, um, how parties are or not, are not capable of uh, facing liability. And if they're not able to face liability, uh, then uh, regulation might be preferable over liability rules. And here's huge uh, area for law and economic scholars, as, as David pointed out, uh, talking about insurance law in the context of uh, climate change. But then when we move to three and four, three is parties would not face the threat of suit for, for harm done. Uh, if the parties do not face the threat of suit for harm done, then perhaps it's better to go with regulation. And that's what we're trying to do with climate change because very few successful lawsuits. So if parties don't face the risk of liability, uh, perhaps let's, let's regulate, but we are not being successful in regulating. Again, over 30 years of trying to do that and we're not being effective. And again, when we talk about huge energy conglomerates, it doesn't matter if one single country regulates them because they operate in multiple countries. So again, the need for a concerted uh, solution. When we look to the fourth item, administrative costs incurred by private parties and by the public in using the tort system or direct regulation. So what Stephen is, 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 is doing is, is telling us here is let's compare which costs more, regulating or, or the cost, administrative cost of liability. If the administrative cost of liability is greater than regulation, let's regulate, let's favor regulation. If it's the other way around, let's favor liability rules. So here is law and economic scholars uh, dealing with liability strictly in the context of Chavel's work, dealing with tort law as a risk regulation tool. And, and that can be uh, a sign of something more. What is this something more? Uh, perhaps uh, to move forward uh, uh, better regulation, we have to increase the threat 
of liability, perhaps, and that's an area of study that I think it's 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 very very uh, uh, promising. Uh, so so when we look at an energy transition cost, basically what we're saying here, when we go back to this basic and seminal article of 1984, is written by Stephen Chavell, is uh, we are comparing we're comparing the estimated cost of a harm with the probability of this harm times the cost of remediation which encompasses uh, uh, the probability of enforcing uh, um, remediation, criminal liability, and eventually administrative liability. Uh, and at the end, what we need to do is uh, to bring some attention to the table is we need to make liability costs, the potential for liability costs higher than the energy transition costs. If we have this fear of that liability cost here is purely uh, law and economics of, of tort law. Uh, punitive damage, the discussions around punitive damages is, is the same kind of a uh, behavior inducement we want to, to generate here when, when we go to, to this kind of analysis. Uh, so this is basically what this uh, equation is showing. Um, so, so through a purely law and economics perspective, perhaps the solution is on a, on a, on a different kind of a tort theory that would enable uh, countries or parties to sue potentially liable parties for damages caused in, caused in, in, in due to, to their greenhouse gas emissions. And why would that be the need of a revised tort theory? It's because of the difficulties of establishing causation and establishing the damage itself. But uh, irrespectively of those difficulties, what we see is a growing number of cases. Uh, and this climate change is very dynamic. As we look to the IPCC reports, the first one and this last one, we can see how dynamic the thing is. And, and, and that dynamism is reflecting uh, upon courts. So uh, we have to rethink, or courts are re rethinking, actually courts are rethinking in this growing number of cases, the standards of liabilities and the way they're interpreting and, 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 and evolving. And the underlying reasons, again, the dynamism of climate change, the advances on climate science and growing weight of evidence of social environmental impacts. But above all, a failure of international lawmakers and domestic policymakers to overcome the challenges of regulating climate change. Courts are being called to step in. So again, we're seeing it all over again. So until now, we're looking into tort law from a risk regulation perspective, which is a purely law and economics view of tort, of tort law. But if we can actually fit the climate change into this uh, economic analysis of tort law, it doesn't really matter because important scholars are, are saying that uh, if, if, if we can't uh, build a precise law and economic theory to, to, to uphold uh, 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 litigation strategy in climate change, uh, what we're seeing is a call uh, uh, on scholars, uh, also on law and economic scholars, to the view, review the role of uh, tort law. But not only for its deterrent effect, which, make is, which makes tort perform a prospective function, as I said, the risk regulation function, but also as an important tool of inducing some kind of behavior. And that's when we, we come to the work of, uh, of, of the Yale professor Douglas Kezar. Uh, uh, and I think he has two great quotes here to, to show how uh, to try to explain this phenomenon of climate change litigation. And, and he's basically saying when TORT addresses its core missions of providing a forum for the airing of grievances and the redress of wrongs, auxiliary benefits inure to the larger political complex within which torts operates. 
these auxiliary benefits are not necessarily deterrence and risk spreading functions. He's dialoguing here with the law and economics uh, scholars. Instead, they run towards more subtle benefits of problem articulation, norm amplification, and intergovernmental signaling of the sort that would be difficult to situate within an abstract model of risk assessment and social welfare maximization. So he's, he's going beyond the law and economic analysis of torts. And, and basically what he's saying is even when a plaintiff's case fails on the merits, judicial engagement with the details of her claim helps to frame her suffering as a legible subject, subject of public attention and governance. So what he's saying here is that uh, even when a regulatory program has been established to the purpose to optimize the balance between prevention and expensive, some mechanism for seeking a knowledge more of residual suffering ought to remain open as a check on governmental complacency. Um, so he is saying that it is the revival of uh, tort law. And so I brought here some examples, some empirical evidence of, uh, of what uh, Daniel is uh, advocating. Um, we have this first uh, case uh, that I brought here, City of New York v. Chevron Corporation. Uh, although New York court rejected the tort claim uh, on the basis that climate change law is a matter of federal regulation, but it doesn't matter. Uh, it, it found it was a case like it's like we said, doesn't matter if the merits was 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 ruled in the favor of the plaintiff or not. But only in the United States, other cases had different outcomes. Those cases. Uh, that are listed in the second bullet there from California, Maryland, Rhode Island, remanded, were remanded to state court, uh, which makes them a tort law cases uh, to be analyzed by state courts. Uh, this this uh, remanded uh, order is currently upheld uh, following a, 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 the decision of the Supreme Court in uh, BPPLC, uh, v. mayors and cities of Council of Baltimore, but uh, it is uh, showing that there is a movement to revive tort law for climate change. In the U.S., another case, important case, Commonwealth of Massachusetts v. Uh, Exxon Mobil Corporation, federal court remanded a claim by Massachusetts alleging breaches of the Massachusetts Consumer Protection Act to the state courts. So, case will proceed to trial. Uh, as the court denied Exxon's motion to dismiss the case. So this is huge, uh, especially considering the strict standing rules uh, in United States uh, civil procedural uh, uh, rules. In Australia, Sharma, uh, by her litigation, represented Sister Mary Bridget Arthur versus Minister of the Environment. A claim was brought by several young plaintiffs uh, and the court decided the ministry owns a duty of care to Australian children, deciding whether to approve the extension of a coal mining. Germany, two important cases, Friends of the Earth, uh, Germany, Supreme Court declared provisions of the Germany National Climate Policy Act unconstitutional for insufficiently setting climate change mitigation targets. Uh, the court's rationale was a violation of rights of future generations. Uh, this other case, Saul Luciano v. Uh, RWE, a Peruvian farmer sue RWE to pay 40 cents, 47 cents, uh, 40 point 47 percent of the cost of them needed in Juarez uh, due to the rise of the sea level of a glacial lake. This number was attributed to RWE due to the share of emissions uh, the company has since the industrialization period. And what is interesting is the Court of Appeals uh, reformed uh, the uh, trial court decision uh, and remanded the case to trial to allow for an evidentiary proceeding uh, to see whether uh, the company had actually contributed or not to climate change and whether that could trigger the problem of the lake uh, in Peru. Uh, and then we come to the landmark, very recent landmark case in the Netherlands, uh, uh, the Hague District Court ordered uh, Shell to reduce CO2 emissions of the Shell Group by 45% uh, by 2030 relative to the 2019 levels. This just happened. This decision is of May 2021. So 
There are many others, uh, of course, but this is just an overview of how courts are being called to move, not precisely under a law and economics uh, analysis theory, but I think there's great room for it. But I think uh, as they were called when the first local environmental problems happened back in the late 60s, early 70s. So uh, to close my participation here, just brief comments on what's going on in Brazil. Brazil, it's as usual, very excited with a lot of things and it is very excited with ESG and climate change. Uh, especially because a lot of people are talking about Glasgow, as there were a lot of people talking um, uh, in, back in, in the late, uh, uh, in, in the early 2000s, uh, about the Oslo Conference when Brazil prepared its climate, National Climate Change Policy Act. But part of this Brazilian excitement is in part due to recent announcement on investors and lenders in US and Europe that they would prefer sustainable uh, uh, projects. And of course, Brazil wants to be at the forefront of sustainable projects. And as a result, there is great action currently in Brazil in the drafting regulations, incorporating crime change risk in the banking systems. Brazilian banking system had a regulation incorporating social environmental risk, but this draft regulation that it's up for comments and, and, and notes I incorporate the climate change risk uh, uh, in the banking uh, system. And there is currently a draft bill instituting a national carbon market in Brazil. But in my personal view, this is me speaking, again, not FGV, not the firm I work for. Uh, it's, uh, it looks to me like the National Climate Change Policy Act looked back in 2009, much more excitement than planning. I don't see discussions over that, according to David, are, uh, are uh, over in many countries. Uh, I never see deep discussions and serious discussions in Brazil about basic concepts such as effectiveness, instrument choice and design, leakage, social cost of carbon, climate change litigation, negative emissions technology, ethics and responsibility, regulatory tools, discount rates, all of the things that David said, very important topics to discuss. The excitement with Brazil, it's with a, an offset market. Uh, it's all people talk about. Uh, we don't see talks, we don't even see a talk between tax or a market, tax completely off the table. Nobody likes to talk about tax in Brazil. Of course, we are heavily taxed in Brazil. Nobody likes to talk about taxes, but uh, there are clever uh, uh, talks about tax that could be brought into the discussion that because we don't talk about it, uh, it's just completely off the table and we just assume uh, an offset market would be the best for the country. Uh, we don't talk about what's the incremental cost of climate change to make a slightly bit of a plan of an impact uh, 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 regulatory solution. Um, we don't talk about cost benefit analysis or even less so about alpha precautionary approach or order decision making methodology under deep uncertainty scenarios. We just assume we need a lot to create a market. Let's move forward with that. Uh, but uh, I think it would be good to have some planning into. We don't talk. Uh, about carbon price, if either through a market or tax, or whether this price shall equal the social cost of carbon. If through tax, we could talk about substituting it for employment taxes, but that's not an issue at all that it being dealt in Brazil. If through a market, we talk a lot about offsets, but we talk little about cap and trade. We, we do try the little mar cap and trade markets in the past, but we haven't been able to, to launch them. Uh, very little discussions about leakage, the impacts on trade. Uh, in a nutshell, it, there seems to be a lot of excitement with offsets, but very little uh, planning. Uh, not to mention that, again, I will come to this uh, very few uh, slides that I have left. Remember, climate change is an energy problem. The Brazilian matrix, energy matrix is 70% uh, uh, hydro. 
So, so the Brazilian contribution for climate change is small, uh, something like 3%. Um, but that does not mean it's not relevant. It's just it needs to be contextualized in the context of let's plan what is the policy design we want, what's the policy design that will be more effective for us. But as I said, because there seems to be overexcitement with uh, offsets, the focus has been little with energy, which is the real problem, uh, and very much with uh, a follow, uh, especially in, in the forestry. And a lot of excitement with those who are more prone to generate uh, offsets uh, and those who are will face the cost of, of, of carbon, they don't seem to be much interested in the discussion, at least uh, so far. Um, so what is the climate change strategy or the environmental strategy? So when we talk about offset in Brazil, focusing on the forestry issue, on preserving uh, available forest, which is very important, are we really talking about a uh, climate a uh, solution or we're talking about an environmental solution, which is just as important because, you know, we want to preserve the forest. And, and so if, if we're designing a policy that it's going to keep our forests uh, intact, that's a good policy. We don't need it to call it a climate change policy. If, we're, if, if, if our ultimate goal is, is to generate crops uh, that will yield uh, net benefits uh, in terms of greenhouse gas or whether we'll keep the remaining Amazon forest uh, um, uh, intact. We can call it a, a payment for environmental service. We can generate goodwill through different ways. And why do I say that? Because uh, if, if we sell it as, as credits, there's always the risks associated with forestries uh, uh, that uh, they might not uh, accurately measure uh, the sink capabilities and the offset capabilities uh, of different projects, uh, those more oriented uh, uh, towards energy field. Um, but because there is a great impact uh, on the G uh, now of you know the the ESG movement, uh, meaning executives. Are, are being uh, called to, to act on, on, on climate change. Uh, buying offsets is, is an easy way to guarantee uh, uh, the yearly bonus. Uh, if, if this is a target that uh, any, any corporate executive has to meet, uh, there's not, nothing wrong about that, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm turning back to David's lecture on Tuesday saying that uh, when we talk about this a folo credits, uh, there's a lot of problems we need to, to account for. Uh, there are a lot of organizations out there, as David, David said, uh, uh, offering certification of those credits, um, but uh, who performs the oversight of those certification entities? Is, is it the government? I remember when I studied forestry uh, uh, credits uh, uh, in my PhD uh, 15 years ago. It was a big concern in the international community that uh, forest offsets would be properly accounted for to avoid uh, an offset being used to increase the problem rather to solve the problem. Uh, and perhaps if we frame it as, as an environmental uh, a payment for environmental services too, Perhaps we can achieve better results. Uh, perhaps we can keep everybody happy as well with an offset that is designed to offer that. Um, but that again would require, in my personal view, a great deal of, of more planning that we currently have uh, in the country. So the questions I think for my, nest, my last notes here is, some of them coincide with uh, David's, uh, how to solve the distributive problems when we, we create policy, when, when we design policies to fight climate change, but that was long and exhausted uh, uh, and analyzed by, by David. Uh, what would be the mitigation obligations evenly around the world, regardless uh, of past emissions? Uh, are we gonna 
uh, solve the problem um, of pointing fingers of who did this and who did that, or, or this is an important issue for the negotiation table and we have to set aside uh, economic efficiency uh, methodologies and, and deal with that political question as well. Uh, compensation for countries to avoid greenhouse gas emissions. David also touched upon this question. Should Brazil be compensated uh, if created a successful program to keep its forests uh, uh, intact? On a personal note, I, I believe yes. Uh, just like I believe in, if any country is, 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 is banned from using its natural resources, uh, there's, there, there, there must uh, be some sort of compensation for that as well, referring to the case of uh, Saudi Arabia that uh, David uh, uh, mentioned as well. And we could even talk about the Brazilian pre-salt uh, as well, but uh, I might be biased uh, when, I, when, I, when, I, when I speak about that, I, I realize that. Uh, important topic that David discussed uh, with us that I think we should be thinking carefully, should in light of this huge problem we face, do we need to rethink the sovereign principle of international law? If so, how? Uh, and should we regulate freedom of speech? A friend of mine from the Catholic University of Lisbon has called to my attention that this has become a big issue in climate change law in the United States, in Europe, of how uh, uh, law may uh, 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 interfere in the freedom of speech when we have uh, climate change deniers, people who deny the science of climate change, how dangerous these people can be and how the law can play a role interfering or limiting the ability of those people in, in an era of, of, of social networks to sprawl uh, this anti-scientific approach uh, so detrimental to a very serious problems uh, we have ahead. So we have a very good book talks a little bit about that, Democracy, Expertise, and Academic Freedom from the Robert Post, the Yale professor, who I highly, uh, highly recommend it. So the conclusion, I could not uh, conclude differently from uh, David, uh, work with climate change. And on that front, I must say, Stanford has been launching a climate change and sustainability school there will be a climate change professional in the very near future. And I'm also aware Columbia a University is putting forward a climate change school. So form people to work with climate change. So this is a huge area, an area full of opportunities, an area that I think law and economic scholars have, uh, have a lot of uh, uh, room to, to collaborate. And to end my presentation, I leave you with this uh, Babe Ruth, famous baseball player in the United States. I'm not a big baseball uh, fan. I like baseball, but uh, I like Babe Ruth's uh, quotes. And uh, he is, this quote, I think it's, 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 it's very good because it says, never let the fear of striking out get in our way. So with that phrase, I turn back to you, Rodrigo. Let's not be... Uh, taken by the fear that this is an unsolvable problem. Let's work together and try to solve it together. <laughs> Thank you, Rodrigo, for, for this very special opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Homel, for, for the class, for the lecture. Uh, we, we received a few questions from, from the audience. Uh, I'm just going to ask you two of them that I think that are uh, have some connection, and then we move to the other ones. Um, Chelsea just uh, pointed out that international public lawmakers have committed to climate change prevention, at least on paper, with limited success from big polluters. Do you think private law can be a driving force for change? And related to that, uh, Luis Cesar, uh, just um, um, ask it and, and pointed that um, 
How could the law correctly regulate the sector? Are Brazilians law efficient? Uh, so something related to the Brazilian laws, to the impact of private law in making some changes on that. Thank you uh, for the questions, uh, Rodrigo, and, and the authors of the questions. Uh, those are great questions. I do think private law is playing a great role and is occupying a field that we are unable to occupy. Uh, just the same way we saw it happen in the late uh, uh, 60s, early 70s, uh, a lot of litigation uh, regarding environmental problems. And I think we're seeing all over again, and that's the call for tort law to come and, 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 and impose obligations upon uh, governments like, the, like the, the Deutsch case we saw obligations upon private parties like we're seeing in the Dutch case um, and and purely tort law uh, on the cases uh, uh, popping out uh, in in the United States are I think good examples of uh, how private law is being called uh, uh, to force uh, a, a faster change in policy making uh, through a very interesting system now, which is uh, foreign litigation, international litigation. So, so I think there will be uh, it would be unthinkable when I went to law school to talk about you know litigating private law in a different jurisdiction from the one you're you're graduated from. But we're seeing more and more cases, not only related to climate change, but relating to social and environmental impacts done by corporations or allegedly done by corporations. That operate worldwide. So, so, so that's the way I think um, uh, private law, especially the the the, the, the law of uh, tort law, it's is pushing for forward a very interesting change in the very recent years, Rodrigo. Uh, we just received a question from Maria Eugenia. Uh, wouldn't the Brazilian focus on a follow rather than on energy be an effect from the international debate that is keen on reproach Brazil from deforestation practice, especially regarding Amazon, instead of rewarding it for the clean energy matrix? Could you elaborate a, a little bit more on an en energy transition agenda for Brazil? Yes, thank you, Maria Eugenia, for the question. Um, I do think the focus on uh, a follow is 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 it's the right way to, to approach. I think Brazil is, a, like I said, an environmental giant. Uh, Brazil has huge potential uh, to to sell offsets uh, from the forestry and agriculture and land use, uh, uh, change markets. Uh, my only concern was, I think we need to do this carefully planned because it is very difficult or it was very difficult, uh, in the past, uh, to measure, uh, precisely those offsets. Uh, I know that there are current voluntary markets that are doing that very well with strong methodologies. Uh, they, assuming that they are uh, doing that, uh, uh, relying on strong methodology, which I have no reason to believe they're not. To the contrary, I have strong motivation to believe that they're doing it. And they're doing it right. I think this is a really good driver uh, with a net positive externality that has huge impacts uh, for Brazil. Because if we are able to generate reliable offset credits, uh, a follow credits from our forestry, agriculture, and land use uh, practices, uh, we will be able, uh, as a net positive uh, uh, benefit, to preserve the forests we have uh, and to, to promote the many environmental services these forests provide uh, us, including for agriculture, for, which is a big giant and uh, an important uh, uh, sector for, for the Brazilian GDP formation. Uh, on the energy transition, uh, I think Brazil has been 
uh, doing it quite well. Uh, uh, we, uh, in the sense that it's, if you look towards the past data, solar and, and, and wind, uh, it's growing exponentially in Brazil. Uh, I remember an engineering telling me that uh, the great, uh, the, 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 the big giant in solar energy is Germany. And he told me the, the worst sun in Brazil is best is better than the better the the, the best uh, uh, sun in 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 Germany. So there is still a lot of potential. Uh, I think the energy sector in Brazil faces other challenges. Some will say that we didn't plan for the demand. Some will say that uh, you know we we uh, are overly relying in water, and there is a huge water shortage that many scientists are linking that to new climate change world. Uh, so I think we, we could have done better in, in changing more of this matrix. And, and the easiest way to do that, uh, to provide uh, security in our energy system is through uh, power plants, uh, natural gas or either coal. And that's, that's a transition we don't want to make. Uh, so I think the transition we need is investing more in solar and energy. Uh, to alleviate a little bit the pressure over our hydro resources that are so much being impacted by, by according to, to, to important people, to, to climate change. So, so those are my, my stakes to these very important questions. Rodrigo. Uh, we are running out of time, but uh, just one last one, and then I, I give word to Maria Luisa to her final words and to you again. Uh, Ruth uh, asked if are there any plans or policies that BRICS countries uh, in particular has to help to curb climate change? Yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent question. Uh, and perhaps, you know, we could create a, we could, we could go to Nordhaus idea of a BRICS climate change club. Uh, but again, we'll face the problem of who is most responsible for past and current emissions. So it would be more effective of a club formed by Europe, China, and the United States. I'm, 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 I'm positive that they do form a club following Nordhaus theory uh, uh, you know, that would be easier for the BRICS to follow, to follow on. Uh, I don't think BRICS would do something like that until they see some real and concrete uh, action from those who are, you know, blamed to be the, the most responsible for, for the problems. But that not to say that they, they can't do uh, nothing. I think Brazil is doing a lot. My, my criticism is that they could do with a little bit more planning, uh, but they are, they are doing, they, you know, the, a, a carbon bill, uh, a carbon offset bill is, is a, it's a major step. Uh, uh, you know, the whole uh, conversation in, in private corporations that I talked to and banking on pushing forward sustainable agendas, the ESG agenda, I think that's, that's great. And, and I think, you know, there's a lot of uh, topics of sustainable finance uh, on the BRICS. BRICS has a bank, uh, uh, has a very uh, uh, well-versed and knowledgeable uh, director that, a Brazilian who is, knows very well all these sort of things. So, so I think there's, there's a lot of things that can be done at the domestic level uh, that generates opportunities for uh, the companies and banks uh, which operates in those BRIC countries. And that can be a collateral, but important, yet important contribution to, to climate change mitigation. Rodrigo. Well, many thanks, Romulo, again. Maria Lucia, please. Okay, <clears throat> thanks so much. I do hope that you have joined this great opportunity. And uh, I would like to invite you to join us again uh, for the second week. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll discuss uh, economic analysis, uh, trying the empirical research, and you'll be this Tuesday at the same time, 3 p.m. Chicago time and 5 p.m. Sao Paulo real time. Once again, thanks so much, Romulo. Thanks so much, uh, 
Rodrigo, and thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye.